Good evening. Tonight, I'm going to tell you another strange and unusual story of the unexplainable which lies behind the veil. Tonight's story is again based on one of those true but utterly unexplainable happenings which occur time and again from country to country and from age to age. George Bosworth was a modern man of his time in every sense of the word and had his story occurred to another he very probably would have been the last man in the world to believe a word of it. Art Bosworth had had a busy day, and now as the last customer left his shop, he prepared to close for the night. One hundred and fifty miles at sea, George Bosworth prepared to retire, completely unaware of the incredible events which were about to occur. Mr. Boswell. Captain, I've got to get back to England immediately. I'm afraid that's quite impossible, sir. Oh, please. I'm afraid something's happened. Are you ill, Mr. Boswell? No, no. Well, yes, maybe. I, I don't know. I can't explain, Captain, but I must return at once. Mr. Bosworth, we're 150 miles from Dover, and I have a schedule to maintain. If I were to turn round and go back without good and sufficient reason, I would in all probability lose my position. But this is an emergency. There are rules and regulations covering all emergencies at sea. Perhaps if you could tell me why... Well, well, my, I think my, my brother is... I can't tell you, Captain. It's terribly important. I'm sorry, Mr. Bosworth, but I can let you off at a stand. There you can make connections with another ship and be back in England by tomorrow morning. What time will we dock? We should be there within the hour. I pray God, Captain, we're not too late. Bullet wound through the arc, fired at close range. Man's been shot. He's dead right enough. From the looks of things, nothing has been taken except money. Cash draws empty. Which leads me to deduce that the motive for the crime was robbery. Got that, Orton? Yes, sir. I checked the Bosworth house. George isn't there. The place is shut up tight. That's odd. Him and Art usually close the shop together. Are you sure you heard the shots at 9.45? Right you are, Chester. 9.45 exactly. Just a minute, Bertha. A little less familiarity, if you please. This here is official police business, and I'm here in my official capacity. Until I've solved this crime, I'll trouble you to remember that I'm a sergeant in Her Majesty's Constabulary. Oh, I am sorry. From now on, I'll remember, Chester. Sergeant. You may proceed, Mrs. Clink. Well, I just put the kettle on. I always mix as a pot of tea in the evenings, just before retiring, as you might say. You know how Alfie likes to get to bed early. Yes, yes, yes. Get on with it. Well... I'd no sooner touched the kettle to the stove when I heard the shots. So I said to Alfie, that sounds like shots. And Alfie said, no. So I said to Alfie, Alfie, them was shots. And Alfie said... Never mind what Alfie said. What did you do? 
Well? The only light that was on was in Aunt Bosworth's shop. So I run down here to see if he'd heard them too. Imagine me horror and surprise to find poor Mr. Bosworth lying there in a pool of blood. Aha! And whose blood would you say it was? Uh, <clears throat> how long would you estimate this was after you first heard the shots, Mrs. Clink? Couldn't have been more than five or ten minutes. Thank you very much, Mrs. Clink. That'll be all. But I haven't finished. If you've anything more to say, you can make a statement at the police station. But I know who done the murder. Mrs. Clink, <laughs> you saw the murderer? Yes, I did. <clears throat> I see. Now, just a minute, Constable, I'll handle this. Now then, Bertha, why didn't you give us this valuable information before this? I was about to, until I was so rudely interrupted. Are you insinuating that I was rude? Sergeant, I... Uh, may I suggest uh, the murderer? Huh? The murderer? Oh, oh, yes, yes. All right, Mrs. Quick, the name, if you please. His name is Albert Ketch. How do you know that, Mrs. Clink? I saw him. Just as I got outside, I saw him run from this very shop, as though the old devil himself was after him. Are you sure? My sight's as good as yours, Chester Wilmore. Uh, Sergeant, uh, shall I round him up? Why, yes, Constable, do that. And see if you can find out what become of George Bosworth. Uh, why not ask Mrs. Clink, sir? I'm sure I don't know, Constable. But why not ask Miss Julie Westcott? She's his fiancé. She ought to know. I'll do that, Mrs. Kling. All right, now. Uh, off with you. Home, all of you, if you please. This here shop will be closed till further notice. Move along, please. Now then, Albert, why don't you confess and save us all a lot of trouble? All nice and tidy, eh? Because I didn't shoot Art Bodsworth, that's why. Aha! Uh -huh. How do you know he was shot? You told me. Oh. What were you doing in the apothecary shop at that time? Well, I was there to collect a debt what was owed me. What was the debt for? Well, you see, I do a bit of carpenter work in my spare time, being handy with me tools, as you might say. And I, I built a set of shelves for Mr. Bosworth here several weeks ago. And it took you several weeks to get paid? Well, uh, well, there was a slight misunderstanding between us, as you might call it. Aha! Uh -huh. well, that don't mean I killed him. What was the cause of this uh, misunderstanding? While I was building the shelves, a case of his medicines got broke. Bosworth got terrible excited. Claimed I'd done it careless lot. Said they was worth more than the shelves and, and he wouldn't pay me. And so you killed him? That's not true. I don't even own a gun. A likely story. Why, I wouldn't be surprised if you wasn't doing a bit of poaching in your spare time. Oh, it's a nasty thing to say. Poaching's a very serious offence. I've a mind to enter charges against you. Sergeant, this man's being charged with murder, not with poaching. You hear that, Albert? The constable's right. Murder's the charge, don't you? Try to throw us off the track with all this talk about poaching. Now, why don't you be a good fellow and confess and save us all this trouble? Now, look here, Sergeant. I'd like to help you, really, I would. But you know I'm not the kind of man who'd kill a chap in cold blood. Albert Ketch, you're making it very hard for us. Very well. If you won't cooperate, we'll have to drag it out of you. We'll start all over again. George, darling. What's happened? Come inside. Something's happened to Hart, hasn't it? Sit down. No, no, tell me. Yes, George, Hart is... Hart's dead. Too late. I'm too late. George, you were on your way to France. How did you get back so quickly? I had a... feeling something was wrong. Who? Who shot him? Who told you he was shot? Uh, do they know who did it? The police have arrested Albert Ketch. Albert Ketch? But he didn't do it. Darling, I know this has been a terrible shock, but you weren't here. How do you know he didn't do it? Julie, please, take me on trust for now. Albert Ketch had nothing to do with Hart's death. Darling, you're upset. 
Why don't you lie down for a little while? I'll bring you some tea. No, 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 please. I've got to convince the police that they're making a mistake. They've no reason to hold Albert. Darling, you asked me to trust you. I do. You know that. Can't you even tell me how you can be so certain? Julie, have I ever shown any signs of insanity? Of course not. Well, I haven't told you yet how I came back so quickly or why. I never even got to France. Because on the boat I had a... a vision. Of what? The whole thing. The whole thing? Yes. I saw the murder being committed. George, tell me exactly what you thought you saw. Well, I was washing, getting ready for bed, and... when I looked into the basin, I saw the apothecary shop. It was exactly as if I was right there, everything as clear as it is now. You must have been dreaming. No, I saw hearts by the shelves. And then I saw the murderer come in and shoot him. You saw the murderer? Who was it? I don't know. But it wasn't Albert Ketch, I'm sure of that. George, you can't tell anybody this. But I must. Ketch is innocent. Julie, you believe me, don't you? Well, what difference does it make whether I... A great I... deal of difference to me. George, I believe you because I love you. If you tell this story to the police... No, that's a chance I must take. That's a chance you must not take. But they'll hang Ketch. Listen to me, George. There's nothing you can do. If Ketch is innocent, he has nothing to fear. But you, if you tell this fantastic tale to the police, you'll be ruined. Julie, a man's life is in danger. How can I think of myself? Well, then think of me. You know they won't believe you. At best, they'll call you insane. And how will I feel? Hearing people talk behind your back, pretending I don't hear them whispering? Julie, Make this is not... Heart. You know how he worked to build up the shop? Will you let all his work go for nothing? Well, that's what'll happen. Do you think people will do business with a man who... who sees things? I'm sorry, Julie. Whatever anybody thinks, I've got to try. Very well, George. If you feel you must, I'll go with you. No, no, no. There's no need for you to become involved. back there, sir. Oh. Well, in that case, we'll have to continue our search in here. Ah, oh, Mr. Bosworth, sir. Allow me to offer my condolences in this horrible tragedy. Thank you, Sergeant. They told me at the police station I'd find you here. May I ask what you're looking for? Clothes, Mr. Bosworth, clothes. And have you found any? Almost. But don't you worry, sir. We have the fiend what done this foul deed. If you mean Albert Ketch, Sergeant, he didn't do it. Why do you say that, sir? Well, I ask you again. What makes you so sure that Albert Ketch is innocent? I can't tell you, Sergeant. You'll just have to take my word for it, but... Albert Ketch had nothing to do with it. Well, that's rather a large order, Mr. Bosworth. Asking us to accept your word without anything to back it up. Mr. Bosworth, sir. I assume you can prove your whereabouts at the time of the crime? Well, yes, I can. I was on a boat on my way to France. Mr. Bosworth, who else besides yourself stands to inherit your brother's estate after his death? Why, no one. I'm the only... Just what are you driving at? Now, I'm sure the constable means no offence, sir. But let me fill you in on the facts. 
We have a high witness what places Albert Ketch at the scene of the crime. He had motive, he had opportunity. Sergeant, have a look here. Looks like an O. It's a bullet hole, I think. Have I your permission to... Help yourself, Constable. It's rather a small caliber. As you say, very small. I'm sure it comes from a Derringer. A Derringer? Well, wouldn't that prove that Albert Ketch had nothing to do with it? Why do you say that? Well, what would Ketch be doing with a little gun like that? Mr. Bosworth's right, sir. It's hard to accept the fact that Albert Ketch would be in possession of a Derringer. Unless it was deliberately given to him by somebody. Now, look here, Constable. So you refuse still to tell us why you think Albert Ketch is innocent? I can't tell you, Sergeant. I'll submit a possibility to you, Mr. Bosworth. I'll submit it's uh, possible you needed money badly enough to want your brother out of the way. I submit that your insistence on Albert Ketch's innocence may very well be more than just a desire to see justice done. And what do you have to say to that, Mr. Bosworth? Nothing. Am I under arrest? Not as yet, but I shall have to ask you to remain within call. Evening, Mr. Bosworth. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Clink. Alfie and me wishes to convey our sympathy for your bereavement. Thank you. Shall we sit down for a minute? Oh, yes, Doc. Thank you. He was a fine man, your brother. A fine man. Always willing to extend credit until Pi died. And never too proud to step in and have a lip with us. And his scales was honest, too. Yes, it was a terrible shock to me, Mrs. Clink. I can well imagine, but never you fear. Albert Ketch shall get what he deserves. Why is everyone so certain that Ketch is guilty? Oh, bless you. Who else could it be? I saw him myself. You saw him? Of course I did. Has nobody told you? That Chester Wilmore. I am the most important witness. Are there any other witnesses? Not a one and no more are needed, I can tell you that. Of course, Miss Westcott might have seen the old thing. Had she been there five minutes earlier? Julie, what's, what's she got to do with it? Of course, she might have been killed if she had. Yeah, but tell me, how does Julie fit into all this? Well, I'd uh, just step out of my house for a breath of air before putting the tea on for Alfie and me when I sees Miss Westcott going into the apothecary shop. And it was hardly five minutes later when I heard two shots. I runs outside, and there goes Albert Ketcher tearing down the street. Naturally, I got the police. And it was hardly no time at all before they had him clapped in the pokey. Julie never said anything about it. Oh, I dare say she didn't want to worry you. So it's the first time I've ever known her to worry about anyone. What do you mean by that? I'm not the one to talk about a body when they're not present to defend themselves. But everyone knows as our Miss Julie Westcott considers herself much better than us common folk. What are you saying, Mrs. Clink? Truth, ask any of the girls, they'll tell you. Her and her fine talk about position and money and station in life. But she wasn't fooling your brother none. No, sir. She wasn't pulling the wool over his eyes. Oh, you poor boy, I've upset you with my wagging tongue. Alfie always says I talk too much. But don't pay any attention to me. <sighs> you better get home and get some rest. And I'll be saying good night. Darling, I've been frantic. Where have you been? I've been walking. The police think I'm involved in Hart's death. Oh, 
George, are they mad? How can they think you had anything to do with it? They have the murderer. No, they haven't. Ketch is no more guilty than I am. Will you stop saying that? The police think he's guilty, isn't that enough? No. Why are you so intent on seeing him hang? I'm not. I... I just don't like seeing you so upset, that's all. Julie? Was there ever any... trouble between you and Hart? Of course not. You know how fond of him I was. Except... Well, he thought I was too ambitious, didn't he? <laughs> well, Hart was an old-fashioned man. He thought a woman's place was in the home. George. You know I only want what's best for you, don't you? Yes, of course. A woman needs security, a home, children, a husband she can be proud of. I know, you've been very patient. Oh, not really, George. There were times during the last five years when I wanted to scream, when I wanted to say to Hart, why won't you pay George enough money so we can be married? He's earned it, he deserves it. But that's all over now. We can be married right away, can't we, George? Well, once a decent interval has gone by... Oh, darling, we'll be so happy. Mrs. George Bosworth. I can't wait to see my friends' faces when I tell them. They didn't think it would happen, you know, really. They didn't think I knew they were snickering behind my back. As if I couldn't tell what they were thinking. That Julie Westcott, she isn't getting any younger. If George doesn't ask her soon, she may not get any more chances. Aren't you exaggerating just a little? Well... Perhaps, just a little. Now, promise me you'll think only happy thoughts while I make us some tea. Julie? Yes, dear? Why down but catch? I've been thinking, perhaps you're right. There really is nothing more I can do. I'll see that he gets a good solicitor, of course. That's very generous of you, George. And as soon as I can, I'll put the shop up for sale. And then we'll be married and we'll move to somewhere... What's the matter? What did you say? We'll be married as soon as I can sell the shop. You can't sell it. Why not? Oh, I know how you feel, but... I can't stay here where everything reminds me of heart. You don't know how I feel. Julie, what's the matter with you? Weren't you listening to me? We live here. Our friends are here. You're an important member of the community, and I'll be your wife, George. They'll respect us. As long as we're together, what does it matter where we live? I won't have it. The shop is doing well here. We have money and position. Do you think I want to start again at the bottom? Not knowing anybody, not being anybody? I forbid it. Julie, you're losing your perspective. I welcome your help, but I must make my own decisions. Welcome my help? Well, that's funny, George. Without me, there'd be no decision for you to make. What are you saying? You've had five years to make a decision, but your precious brother stood in the way. Well, I made it for you. He's gone, and I won't let you throw away everything I've worked for. George, listen. I did it. For you. For both of us. How could you? Julie! I wanted you. I needed you. Heart stood between us and I couldn't bear it any longer. But it's all over now, George. He's gone. There's just the two of us. And we'll be happy, George. You'll see. George, don't leave me. Please. I'm going to find Sergeant Wilmore. George! George! So, George, shocked and stunned as few men have had the misfortune to be, did his duty as he saw it. Bereft of brother, fiancé, he still had a life before him. Time would heal these scars, but 
but would it ever bring to him an understanding of how he could have seen his brother's death? I don't know. Do you? On the day our story takes place, John Prescott's problem is a very ordinary one. An automobile and the problem of getting it rolling. But as the hours passed, he found himself concerned with things not so ordinary. Sorry. You all right? I think so. I'll tell you more when I stop shaking. You did come around there awfully fast. I didn't know what made me do it at the time. Now it seems like a fine idea. Trouble? My car won't start. Let's have a look at it. Turn it over. Battery okay. Nothing loose. Have you got gas? Well, I should have. This uh, gauge kind of acts up sometimes. As you say, gas gauges act up sometimes. I'll push you out of the way and we'll go get some gas. All right. No, I'm sorry. No harm done. A little paint from your car scraped onto mine. It's my fault. I'll uh, straighten out your license plate and we'll be wrapped and ready. LK333. Meet uh, 5H3872. <laughs> That ought to serve as a proper introduction. Get my car. I'll drive you to wherever you want to go. Uh, I'm John Prescott from Boston. I'm Lila. Yes, sir. For. A cocktail to settle my nerves, a little talk, a chance to get better acquainted, uh, perhaps dinner. You know, I can't. I have to get back to my car. Oh, nonsense. Nothing can happen to your car. As for us, who knows? Complications, no uh, husband in the offing. Oh, no, nothing like that. Then let's have at it. The Azure Vault dares the assault of wings, and I, Icarus, am I. Thank you. 
to a lovely lady. You have an easy way with words, John Prescott. A way uncommon with the Boston man. Throwback to my great-great-grandfather, Miles Prescott. A rider? A ship's captain. He sailed for the Orient, but was believed lost at sea with all hands. And was he lost? To the family. Twenty years later, he was found in Tahiti and refused to come home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's better. Gardenia's my favorite flower. Compliments you, Sal. No be white like your skin, warm like your eyes, yet so mysterious, so beautiful, it's almost unreal. Let me talk to Morgan Dent. Get out of here. Well, I haven't finished my drink. Please, we must go right away. Hurry, please. What's it all about? Later, let's just get out of here now. Who's Morgan Debs? I heard the bartender ask for him on the phone. That's what panicked you, isn't it? Yes, now can we please go? I, I, I'll tell you about him later. Wait a minute. You were gonna tell me something, but you haven't said a word since we left the cafe except pull in here. Now what about it? You're in trouble, aren't you? Yes, but there's nothing anybody can do about it. Maybe there is. I, for instance, am uh, quite a remarkable fellow. Tell me, who is Morgan Debs? I can't talk about it here. Please drive away or I'll be in more trouble. I don't see how that's possible. Look at you, you're scared to death. Now, calm down. Tell me the trouble. We can work something out together. Make up your mind to it, because I'm not leaving until you do. All right. There's a road down the highway that leads to Lookout Point. I'll meet you there at 9 o'clock. Please be satisfied with that. No brush off. Promise? I promise faithfully. All right, then. Lookout Point at 9 o'clock. You be there. I'm coming after you, Morgan Debs or no Morgan Debs. I'll be there. Do you mind if we sit quietly for a few moments? A great part of my life is wrapped up in memories of Lookout Point. Now I come back here as often as I can. You're talking like a grandmother. I bet it wasn't too many years ago that you were giving the boys a bad time in high school dances. <laughs> in the college, wasn't I the one? Is that where you met Morgan Debs? No. Morgan's a much older man. I suppose we have to talk about him. If I'm going to help you. And I'm determined on that point. Then listen carefully, John Prescott. This spot, Lookout Point, was my favorite place in the world. It was here that I brought all my problems and here that I came to celebrate my small triumphs. Then one night, something terrible happened. You sit tight. I'll slip into my armor and go face the dragon. Mr. Prescott? Do I know you? I think you've heard of me. I'm Morgan Debs. 
I've heard of you. What are you doing up here? Delivering a message, Mr. Prescott. The young lady you're expecting will not be here. She agrees with me it is advisable for you to go on your way and make no further effort to see her. Why didn't the young lady give me the message herself? As I said, she will not be here. I don't know where you're getting all your information, but you're fouled up tonight. She's been here for the last 15 minutes. Lila? Lila? was here a minute ago. What did you do to her? Nothing. I have moved from this car, as you very well know. You didn't have to. You've got a hold over her. She's scared to death of you. Why? Steady, Charles. We have no quarrel with Mr. Prescott. Now, why don't you just drive on and forget what happened here tonight? Why don't you tell me why I should? Now, remember, Charles, steady. A man can't lose a beautiful girl in the woods and just forget about her. Even if I assure you that she's all right? Then you do know what happened to her. Yes, I know. Well, at least tell me where I can reach her so I can call her or send a note or send flowers. I can't just run away like this. I'm afraid you'll have to, Mr. Prescott. No, so far, no harm has been done. But if you persist pursuing this matter, innocent people will be hurt. Now, you don't want that to happen, do you? Of course not. But on the other hand, I don't want to go through the rest of my life wondering what this is all about. I'm afraid you have no alternative. Now, just drive on. I'll take care of everything here. You put me in an awkward position. You put yourself in an awkward position. I'm trying to get you out of it. My name is Prescott. I think I should report something that happened tonight. I was at a place called Lookout Point with a girl, and she disappeared. Disappeared? You mean she ran away from you? I don't know. I was sitting with her in my car when a man named Morgan Debs drove up. I got out to talk to him. And when I looked at the girl, she was gone. Well, who was the girl? Lila. I don't know her last name. Did Morgan Debs know her? He must have. After she disappeared, he told me to forget about it. But if something happens to her... Well, what could happen to her? I don't know for sure. But I'll tell you one thing. She was afraid of him. Did she tell you why? She was just about to when he drove up. That's not much, Mr. Prescott. Morgan Debs is a powerful man in this community. I can't very well question him without something a little more substantial to go on. Isn't it enough to know that she was afraid of him? Well, I only have your word for it. If I could talk to the girl. Uh, can't you tell me something more about her? She was beautiful, blonde, blue eyes, drove a red sports car. Her name was Lila and she used to live around here. You ought to be able to recognize her from that. Sorry, I don't. Maybe she was before my time. I've only been sheriff here a year. Where are you headed, Mr. Prescott? I was driving home to Boston. But I don't think I should leave until I make sure that the girl's all right. Well, you get her name and I'll do what I can to help you. In the meantime, where will you be if anything comes up? I'll be trying to help myself. You? Yes, I want to talk about a girl. A man that can't find time for that is a coward. This is a particular girl. Blonde, blue eyes. Drove a red sports car. Stalled a few miles up the highway. She came here to get gas for it, remember? Well, I should from that description. But there's been no girl here. 
You sure? Yep. I left her here before dinner. Were you on duty then? I'm on duty all the time. Well, then you must remember her. You or somebody around here had to drive her back to her car with the gas. Wasn't me. I wouldn't forget a dish like that. Besides, I haven't sold a gallon of gasoline since late this afternoon. And that was to a kid on a motorbike. You must be doing something somebody don't want you to do. Uh, looks that way. Did you see who it was? No. I heard a car, thought it was business, came out here and found you. Did you see the car? Just the taillight as it drove away fast. Whoever it was knew their stuff. You're not marked up. Uh, not so you can notice it. Do you know Morgan Debs? Mr. Debs? Sure. If it wasn't for him, I couldn't keep this place open. You a friend of his? In a way. At least I'm getting to know him better. So we're closed. All I want from you is information. Remember me? Can't say I do. I was in here with a lady. Could be. I don't see everybody. Bar gets busy. We were here early. You wouldn't forget her. Beautiful blonde. Who was she? You say you were with her, don't you know? I'm trying to be very patient with you. We sat right there. What are two martinis? You recognize the girl went to that phone and called Morgan Debs. Who's Morgan Debs? Quit clowning. The girl and I both heard you ask for him. All right, so I called Morgan Debs. A lot of people call him. He's a big man. The girl got scared when she heard his name. Why? Why don't you ask Morgan Debs? I'm working up to him right now. I'm asking you. I don't know. Everybody has dame trouble sooner or later. Why don't you have a night captain? This is no dame trouble. This is a lady. Now, who is she and what is she afraid of? I don't know. Her first name is Lila. What's the rest of it? I don't know, I tell you. You knew enough to make that phone call. I'd suggest you tell me why you still can. I can't, mister. I can't. Choke away from... I can't tell you. Kirby. Lila Kirby. Does she live around here? She did. A mile on the highway. Turn. Left. That's better. <laughs> Mrs. Kirby? Yes? I'm John Prescott. I hate to bother you at this time of night, but it's important that I talk to you. About what, Mr. Prescott? Your daughter. Come in, young man. What about my daughter? I was with her tonight. She left me. Oh, that is, uh, we got separated somehow. I wanted to make sure she was all right. Of course she's all right, Mr. Uh, Prescott? Uh, John Prescott. How nice of you to bother. She's up in her room. May I see her for a moment? Well, it's awfully late, isn't it? Yes, and I apologize for intruding, but it's very important. If you wait in the study, I'll tell her you're here.
You're a difficult man, Mr. Prescott. That's what my mother always said. Beat him, she said, and he's stubborn as a mule. Wheedle him, and he's yours. I'm sorry about the beating. Very artistic job. I told Charles to keep an eye on you, that's all. May, uh, may I try a little wheedling, as your mother used to say? It's too late for that. I talked to Mrs. Kirby. She's gone upstairs to get Lila. She won't be back, and Lila's not upstairs. She's dead. Dead? She went off lookout point three years ago in her car. Was killed instantly. Well, that's impossible. I was with her tonight. I talked to her. What kind of a joke is this? No joke, unfortunately. Here. Read those. Go on, read them. If Lila is dead, who was I with tonight? I think you were with Lila Kirby. That's ridiculous. I can't explain it. This is the second time she's reappeared. She seems to be drawn to Lookout Point, the scene of the accident. And uh, when you get there, she disappears? Yes. I was hoping this time would be the end of it. According to these, you were with her. Yes. Lila's impulsive. I was the guardian for her father's estate, and there were things I had to discuss with her. And the night in question, she... She didn't like the things that I was saying, and... started to drive away. What about Mrs. Kirby? She's gone upstairs to get Lila. She is Lila's mother, isn't she? Yes, and my sister. Lila's death was a terrible shock to her from which she hasn't completely recovered. That's why I want to keep the news of these reappearances away from her. Anything that reopened the tragedy to her might... might result in her becoming completely deranged. I don't know. Maybe I am difficult, as you say. But it's hard to believe. Such a beautiful girl, so full of life. I met her this afternoon. Her car was stalled on the highway. Turned out she was merely out of gas. What kind of a car was it? A red sports car, low, rakish. Just the kind you'd expect her to drive. That's Lila's car, all right. But it's been lying at the foot of Lookout Point for three years. Hardly seemed worthwhile trying to have it towed away. Now you understand why I didn't want to tell you anything of this. LK-333. Meet uh, 5H3872. Did John actually see Lila? How can we ever truly know? But of this we are sure. It is not the only case of this kind which has been reported. In my pursuit of these strange and unusual happenings, I have come across several other such occurrences. Experts have a name for this, but to define it is not to explain it. The explanation still lies beyond our present understanding. For how long? Who is to say? Tonight's story was developed 
from the report contained in the files of the Gloucester Historical Society. Like many others which I have come across in the course of my research, it involves happenings of which we've long been aware, but for which there are no satisfactory explanations. Captain John Elwood of Gloucester, Massachusetts, had been a long time at sea, but his first thoughts were not of his wife and his home. If they had been, perhaps none of this would have happened. Everything's in order, sir. Thank you, Mr. Elwood. The crew is anxious to leave, sir. Most of their wives are waiting for them on the wharf. Uh, indeed. The way they're behaving, you'd think we were months overdue instead of just two weeks. And they've likely heard of our trouble with the snakes, sir. Happy to see us alive. Uh, well, just the same, they'll grab their member of the ears and march them off to the paymaster before they start to kiss them. Ah, sir, some. There are all kinds among them. Is Mrs. Elwood out there? Oh, no, sir. The captain's wife is too well-bred to show her emotions in public. Indeed. I want you to do something for me, Mr. Logan. Uh, I have to go to the company's office to make my report. Will you see that my gear is taken straight to my house? I'll do it myself, sir. That's very kind of you. Tell Mrs. Elwood that I'm fine. Be with her presently. Aye, aye, sir. Just put it anywhere here, Mr. Logan. I do appreciate your coming. I was so worried, what with the hurricane and reports of the plague. Oh, it wasn't the plague, ma'am. Oh? Uh -huh. Well, just a lot of poisonous snakes that came aboard while we were in Florida. There was talk that some of the men died. Aye, two seamen. Three others were bitten, but we saved them. It must have been a terrible experience. We were finding snakes, ma'am, all over the ship two weeks after leaving the wharf. Did the captain say how long he'd be? No, ma'am. Just said to tell you that he'd be along, presently. Well, best be getting his dinner. Yes, ma'am. Thank you kindly, Mr. Logan. You're welcome, ma'am. Good to be back, Barney. This place is more like home to me than my own house. Hey, we missed you, John. <laughs> What's been happening while I was away? Oh, now, let me see. Uh, the Clarewell, founded two weeks ago off the coast, nobody lost. Uh, the, uh, the packet from England was late again, <laughs> as usual. Uh, I think that's about all. Things have been fairly quiet. Uh, <laughs> see, uh... How about those snakes, John? Uh, when are you going to tell us about them? As soon as I get something to wash the salt out of my throat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bessie! Coming! Coming! And all of a sudden, there they were, slithering up the lines and the gangplanks like so many fiends of hell. There's hundreds of them, somebody yelled. See that they pay their passage before they come aboard, I said. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there, my pretty. <laughs> You're the one I've missed the most since I went away. You ought to be ashamed, taking such liberties, and you a married man. Well, if I weren't married, would you still object? Ask me no questions and I'll tell you no lie. <laughs> Afternoon, Mrs. Alwood. Good afternoon. I'd uh, like a bottle of that Spanish wine that Captain Elwood favors. I think he'd enjoy it with his dinner. Be supper, more than likely, ma'am. Club's having dinner in his honor. But I'll get it for you.
nobody would have been hurt, but some of the fools tried stamping on the snakes with their bare feet. Excuse me, gentlemen. Are you by any chance spying on me? Oh, no, John. I only came... I know why you came. Go home and expect me when you see me. Charge the spoilage to me, Captain Barney. My apologies, gentlemen. Shall we go home now, dear? You humiliate me in front of my friends. You spy on me. I'll never do it again. I... But I wasn't spying, I swear it. I only wanted to get a bottle of wine for your dinner. And the table. Was that part of your affection? I don't know what came over me. I... John, all the time you were gone, I missed you so. I prayed for you. And when you turned your back on me, I wanted to strike out and hurt you as I was hurt. I'm so ashamed. Well, you should be. I'm sick of your explanations, sick of your apologies. I'm sick of you, Ruth. No, John. Leave me something. Ever since I married you, I've been trapped. And for what? The price of a ship that went to the bottom three months after I bought her. You needn't have said that. I knew why you married me. I knew my father's money made up for the fact that you didn't think I was gay and amusing like the other girls were. I knew my friends were laughing at me. Because they knew why you married me. But it made no difference. I loved you. I still love you. Oh, you're talking nonsense. No, John. Please hear me out. Let it alone, woman. You're digging up things that are best forgotten. No, I... I couldn't bear it if it were only the money. There had to be something else. John... Maybe it's not too late. Maybe we could start all over. Oh, Ruth. John, I'm drying up into a bitter old woman. Help me. Please. I'll unpack your things. What's the matter? A snake! It ain't dead me. What? John? It's all right, Ruth. The snake is... He's dead. I killed him. Oh, I've taken care of your hand, and the doctor will be here soon. I don't think we'll need him, though. I... I'm sure I got all the poison out. You saved my life. Well, there wasn't much else I could do. You could have let me die. Why didn't you? Don't be foolish. But you could have. If you had, you'd be free. No more arguments. No more trouble. You could do as you pleased. But you didn't. You saved my life. Oh, John. Maybe we can start all over. Maybe. Try to get some rest, Ruth. Huh? Do something warm to drink. Hey, 
It's a lucky thing you were home, John. Snake bite's a terrible way to die. Well, she's much better now, and the doctor says for the little rest she'll be just as good as new. Hey, you're thankful for that, I'll wager. Oh, I can't wait to sail again. Always more trouble ashore than when you're at sea. Uh, and I can't make any money just sitting here, much as I like it. Speaking of money, here's something that'll make you sit up and take notice. Oh. The widow Smith got a letter from London this morning. Seems an uncle died and left her 20,000 pounds. 20,000 pounds? Eh? He'd be a lucky man that gets her. He could buy any ship in the harbor with that. Too bad you're already married, John. You know, I always had a sneaking suspicion that uh, she was partial to you. Well, drink up and let's have another one on the house. <laughs> hey, you're not still thinking of that money, are you? Oh. <laughs> it won't do you any good. You got one wife too many. Come on, have another drink. Oh, thank you, Barney. I don't think I will. I'm going to get back to Ruth. Yes, dear? I've been thinking over what you said. Maybe what happened this afternoon is a sign for both of us. We will make a fresh start. Oh. Bye, Harry. I'm going to take you with me on the next voyage. I'll fix it all up with the owners in the morning. Oh. Oh, John, I love you for the thought. Are you sure you want me to come along? Why, of course I do. Oh, I've been very selfish about the whole thing. Seeing new places, doing new things, and you've just been left alone here in this old house. No wonder you were unhappy. Oh, no, it's not that at all. I love our house. Well, you want to come with me, don't you? Oh, yes, of course I do. But I warn you, I'm not very good on both. Huh? I get... Oh, oh, nonsense. A couple of days at sea and you'll be just like a regular old sailor. Besides, I want you to come. John, you won't be sorry. From now on, things will be different. Yes. From now on, things will be different. Have the carpenter repair the after deck ladder before somebody breaks his neck. Aye, sir. How are you feeling, Ruth? I'm much better, John. Good. I'm better. Good, good. The cook's made you some more of his special tea. Another calm day like this and you'll be completely well. I didn't mean to be such a burden to you, John. You've been very patient with me. Ah, oh, nonsense. I should have brought you before. You've no idea what a comfort you've been. No idea how lonely a captain's life is. Oh, I should like to be with you as often as you'll let me. So you shall, my dear. Don't let your tea get cold. Uh, you know, I, I dozed for a while and I had... Strangest dream. Oh, I hope it was a good one. Oh, mm, yes. I dreamt this was our old ship. And instead of cotton, there was money in the hole. Well, I couldn't improve on that myself. Oh, we were so happy in the days when we had money, John. I find I'm thinking of them more and more since we left home. But when I'm well, things will be different, John. You'll see. Yes, yes. Yours! You're not very well. You, uh, you'd better come and lie down and get some rest. I didn't mean to get sick, John. All right. I didn't want to get sick. I'm such a burden to you. I should have stayed home. I should have stayed at home. Try to get some sleep. You asked me to see you after my watch, sir. Yes, I did, Mr. Logan. Frankly, I'm very worried about my wife's illness. You've always been handy around the sick, and... 
Well, frankly, I thought maybe two heads be better than one. Yes, sir. I wondered if... if you'd take a look at Mrs. Elwood, too. I'd be glad to do anything for the missus, sir, if I can. Good. First, I thought it was cholera. No, sir. It's like nothing I've ever seen. Well, if she's not better in a few days, we'll lay a course for St. Augustine. Aye, sir. And uh, you'll uh, enter a full report in the log, won't you? I will, Captain. I do hope she's better soon. Thank you, Mr. Lillard. Way to St. Augustine, John. We had some rough weather during the night. Slowed us up. Rough weather? I didn't even feel it. You were unconscious, I'm afraid. We must get there soon, John. We will, dear. We will. Now try to get some rest. I have to go up on the bridge. Elwood. Sir, we're way off our course to St. Augustine. If we don't turn now, we'll... I'm well aware of our position, Mr. Logan. My order stands. We stay on course for Jamaica. But I looked at Mrs. Elwood yesterday, sir. She won't last that long. My wife and this ship are my responsibilities. She'll be alive when we get to Jamaica, I warrant it. As you say, sir. Back in there. Liar. You brought me dead. Mr. Logan. Mr. Logan. You had enough poison to kill two people. You might as well know it now. I wanted you dead, and now you will be. You're an evil man, John Elwood. You'll be repaid with evil. You. John, you can't spend the rest of your life in mourning. You got too many good years ahead of you. I miss her, Barney. Oh, of course you do. It's only natural, but you've got to start thinking of yourself. Ruth wouldn't want you to become a hermit. It's lonely without her. Uh, but at your age, that can't last forever. Uh, the uh, widow Smith has been visiting you, hasn't she? Yeah, she's been very kind. She knows what it means to lose someone you love. She's a fine woman, John. I think she's got her eye on you. Oh, nonsense, Barney. I'd never think... Oh, I'll give you a year. Nobody expects you to wait longer. And, John, it's time you got out of the house now. Think so? I do. Uh, we're having supper tonight in honor of a new member. Your old first mate, Logan. You've got to come, John. He'll be expecting you. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm giving you orders. <laughs> now stop acting like a lost puppy. All right, Barney, if you say so. I do, sincerely. <laughs> now it's time for me to get back to the club. My Captain Logan. 
Congratulations and welcome to the club. Thank you, Captain. I haven't seen you since the inquest. I feel I owe you an apology. You were right and I was wrong. I, I, I should have changed course for St. Augustine when you wanted me to. Makes no difference. Now. But it might have and... You were trying so hard to help her, you almost gave me the impression at times that you thought I wanted her to die. Gentlemen, gentlemen, the food is on the table, gentlemen. Uh, oh. Clumsy wench! I didn't do it, sir. I didn't, I didn't! You're the only one in this room? I didn't touch it, sir. I swear I didn't touch it. Look. It's exactly the same as when Mrs. Elwood did it. Twas a ghost, sir. Twas a ghost that did it, sir. Stop that nonsense. A thousand pardons, Captain. Uh, give us ten minutes, and uh, in the meantime, the drinks are on the house. Now, get out, both of you. You may come in now, gentlemen. Twas the girl did it, gentlemen. Saints preserve us. It was her ghost. Her ghost. No. No. You fools, are you frightened by a superstitious servant girl? Barney Logan, help me, I'll show you. It's nothing. You're behind this, Logan. You're trying to trick me. Trick you into what, Captain? You think I killed her? You're trying to trick me into saying that I did. No, I didn't. I swear I didn't. I didn't. I swear I didn't. Captain Elwood, I think you'd better leave. Aye, he finally got a ship, if he could call it that. No other master would sail her around the harbor. She leaked like a sieve, and her crew, well, I wouldn't sail with them across, uh, across a mill pond. But it was all Elwood could get, so he took her. Captain Barney. Gentlemen, have you heard? It's the Coberly. The Cobra. That's Elwood ship. Aye, her crew's just been brought into the harbor. What happened? Nobody knows. They say that the weather was fair, and the sea was calm, and suddenly she just broke up. But her crew was saved. Aye. All of them, all except Captain Elwood. It's retribution. The devil has claimed his own. Gentlemen, the food is on the table. <laughs> The law demands an eye for an eye. He who takes a life must be prepared to forfeit his own. But the law is man-made. And when there is no proof, the law is helpless. Captain Elwood never came to trial. Nevertheless, he was found guilty and executed. Who was his executioner? We may never know. But an unseen force that can overturn a heavy table is not to be reckoned with lightly. All through his history, man has constantly striven to push back the frontiers of knowledge, to discover what lies behind the veil which separates knowledge from ignorance. In my own lifetime, I've seen things come to pass that would be unbelievable to my parents and to my grandparents. Travel through the air, 
the ability to speak to a friend halfway around the world. Well, if these wonders have occurred in so short a time, just think of what our children and grandchildren will be able to know and understand. Happenings that to us defy explanation will be commonplace and ordinary to them. But whether we understand it or not, the event that we depict in tonight's story was very real. It started with a cry for help, a plea to Almighty God, and following that, to a mortal. To a man referred to by the peasants of a tiny Italian village as Il Dottore. Mi preghiamo, Gesù. Mi preghiamo, non più di questo. Oh, Madonna, non ti credo, Gesù. Salvaci questa bambina. È la nostra vita. Non abbiamo altro al mondo. E abbiamo tante di quelle preghiere. Faccia che il dottore venga in tempo. Madonna, santissima. Sì. Sì, cara, ti passerà. La mamma è qui con te, amore. No, no, caro, no. How long has she been like this? All day, off and on. Has she eaten? No, she won't take her food. Nothing, nothing. Mamma mia, look. Ma non giochi, dice il dottore. Il dottore. Io te chiedo, ma... Sì, 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 sì. Dottore. Tony. 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 Oh, what is it, Mama? It's Francesca. She's worse. But the truck is broken down and oh. it is two miles to the top. You want your sister to die? Do you not have two good legs? Stupid with a father oh. maestro! Oh. Take two tonight when you go to bed and two in the morning when you get up. Understand? Wait three days and if you don't feel better, come and see me. <laughs> ah, that's my son. He is here. Yes, Signor Angelo is here, Doctor. Signor Angelo. Oh. How's my Marie? Oh, fine, fine. Woo. Here, let me help you. <laughs> Angelo, my son, my son. <laughs> Welcome home. And how glad I am to be here, Father. What oh, delayed you? Was your train late? No. Giuseppe had trouble with the car. <laughs> this is the second time this week he's broken down, Doctor. It's too old. Giuseppe, take those things upstairs. Go oh. stand here in the draft, Doctor. Take him inside by the fire. I go get something to warm him up. <laughs> oh, my son, it is good to see you home again. You're looking well. But it is a long time, over a year. I know. And I had a terrible job getting away from the hospital, even now. So? Too many patients already? Oh, it's not so much that, Father. They are short-handed. They lost two surgeons last month, and... Well, you know how it is. Ah, uh, who should know better than I? How about you? Oh. Go along from day to day, nothing much happening, same as usual. No, I mean your health. You look tired. No one gets any younger. Do you still permit them to bother you as much as ever? Bother me? Oh, I know these peasants. Every time they stub a toe, they yell for the doctor like children. Only worse, in my opinion. There's some excuse for children. Ah, they are like children. They frighten so easily. But the trouble is, one never knows how serious it may be. The stomachache can be unripe apples or an appendix. A little temperature, a simple cold, or, or maybe the beginning of a serious fever. But a doctor is rewarded by... I know the arguments. But seriously, Father, you look far too tired for my liking. You are absolutely right, Signor Angelo. Some days he's running from morning until night, and it's no good my talking to him. Maybe you can make him see some sense. 
Or better still, maybe you can stay here and be the doctor. Well, I, I don't know about that. I'm going to prevent the rallies. I better hurry. You see? Always running, always running. You have to go out? Oh, it is not very far. But on a night like this, can't I go for you? No, it is for the poor old grandmother, but nothing can be done for her. Well, in that case, can't you miss just once? Listen to that wind. There's a storm blowing up. Oh, the poor soul counts on seeing me every evening. If I miss just once, she would have a bad night. She's not too many left. Well, here's to the future. And here's to that long rest that I'm going to see to it that you have. Ah, and how are you going to manage that? Come back here and take my place? And bury myself here in this... I'm sorry, Father. I... I didn't mean that. Oh, you're quite right, my son. This is no place for a rising young surgeon. <laughs> well, in the big hospitals, there's much more opportunity. Up-to-date equipment and... you know. Yes, we have none of that here. But there is one thing here that is just the same. What is that? The patients. Whether it is in a big city hospital or peasant's cottage, the patients are just the same. All a little helpless, a little frightened. Well, I must go. I wish you didn't have to leave. Tell you the truth, I wish I didn't, too. <laughs> Giuseppe! Yes, doctor? Time to get started. I'm ready, doctor. Yeah, well, I think I have everything here. Though the good God knows that all the equipment in the finest hospitals in the world could not help that poor old woman now. All I can do is to give her a little friendship, a little comfort. Angelo, it is amazing what power those things have. Sometimes I think they do more good than all my pills. <laughs> I brought you a present. Huh? A new bag. A fitted one with everything in it. A fitted bag. But I warn you, you're not going to need it for long. How is that? Because you're going to retire. And you're going to come and live with me in the city. Retire? <laughs> Leave these people? But, but, Angelo, they are my children. I... I could not do that. Why, no, no. I could never do that. Now you get back before the storm gets any worse. Don't let them keep you talking. <laughs> I'll be back before you know it. Look, Signor Angelo. He's aging far too quickly for my liking, Maria. I'm worried about him. Yes, he is tired, and he gets more tired every day. But now that you are here, it's going to be easier for him. I'm not going to stay, Maria. Oh? You've got to help me. I want him to come and live with me in the city. You're the only person that can help me persuade him. Take him away from here? You can't do that. Why not? I, uh, they wouldn't let you. Who wouldn't? The people here, they can't do without him. Is there so much sickness here, then? Oh, it, it isn't only sickness. It's, it's everything. Anything that happens, it's ask the doctor. And he never refuses. Oh, mamma mia, who can it be? I'm coming! I'm coming! Are you trying to knock the door down? Tony Bianchi, what do you want? The doctor, he must come at once. The doctor is not here. But he must come. But how can he come if he's not here, stupido? What's the matter, Tony? Buenos is that, Signor Angelo? It is little Francesca. She is very sick. And Mama has seen it. She will die. But... All right, I'll come, Tony. There's a bag with a suitcase. It's a black one. Will you get it for me? Yeah. But it is the doctor. Mama said... I am a doctor, too, Tony. But... She is very sick. Where is that pony? I should have gone myself. Why doesn't he come? The doctor will come. He always does. Coraggio, coraggio. Dottore. Dottore. 
Careful, Maria, that Otto Zenz is hurt. Now what have you done with yourself? He scalded with boiling water. Let me see. It is nothing. Aye, that is bad. Fix it easily. Oh. Ah. Let me do this for you. able to use this hand for a while. Giuseppe, go get the doctor's slippers. Come and sit down, doctor. Where's Angelo? Upstairs? No, he went out. Ah. Only Bianchi came for you. Uh, Francesca, the little girl, she is sick. And Angelo went? Yes. Did Tony say what was wrong with the child? No. He just said that she's very sick. But you know how they are. They are always very sick. Shall I put the car away, doctor? No, Giuseppe. Maybe I'd better go myself and see. What? You go out again on a night like this and, and with that hand scalded? Oh. Did Tony come in the truck? No, I don't think so. You mean they walked in a storm like this? They are both young. Now you stay right there, no nonsense. Uh, I hope he'll be all right. Of course he'll be all right. He's a doctor, isn't he? I know, but... You worry too much. Now, you stay right there and rest, and I'll go finish the dinner. Uh, Giuseppe, take the car and go down the road. You may be able to pick them up before they get there. Yes, Doctor. In any case, wait and bring Angelo back. And va bene. I'm a doctor. Where's the child? What have you done? I told you to bring the doctor. What have you done? I couldn't help it, Mama. The doctor wasn't there. My father was out on another call. Tony said it was urgent, so I came instead. But, but we need a doctor. I am a doctor, Senor Bianchi. I can do everything that is needed. Now, where's the child? In there? No. Dottore. Dottore, no. No la tocchi, dottore. No la tocchi, My baby, my baby. Just a minute, let me look at her. No, no, you must not touch her. I'm not going to harm her. some water on the fire. You heard me, I have to boil these instruments. What are you going to do with them? I'm going to operate on the little girl. No, no, Senor Angelo, you will not touch. We will wait for the doctor. Don't you understand how sick your child is? You will not touch her. Do as I say, put that water on the fire. 
of all the stubborn fools. We will wait. Giuseppe, what are you doing here? Where's my father? He's sending me with a car to take you back. Go back and get him. Tell him these fools won't let me operate and it's a matter of life and death. Now hurry. Now will you put that water on? We wait for the doctor. There won't be time then. This way they'll be ready for him. You're too stubborn to let me help you. Pray. Pray that my father gets here in time. Angelo, get out. I say you must not touch her. I can't wait any longer. You must not touch her. Stop, you fool. Your child is dying. One minute, two minutes, she'll be dead. Do you want her dead? Do you want to kill her? You just died. You just died. Graziato. Dottore. Thank God you've come. Now, will you go? Be quick. It's diphtheria. Giuseppe, I'll clean up here. It'll take some time. She's gonna be all right. See to it that the child has absolute quiet. You understand? Has Giuseppe come back with the car yet? No, Signor Angelo. Are you not going to wait for the car? No, it's probably broken down again. I'll be back in a few hours to see how the child is. My father's too tired to come. He's completely worn out. I'll have to come alone. You understand? Senor Angelo. Yes? Many thanks. Doctor. The car again, Mr. Angelo. I can't start it. Where is my father? At the house. Here you are at last. I say, 
made dinner for you. I hope it hasn't spoiled. How's Francesca? She's fine. Is father all right? Yes, he's inside, but, but where's Giuseppe? Are you all right, father? Father? Hmm? Huh? Oh, it is you, Angelo. Are you all right? Well, yes, I'm all right. Thank goodness, I was worried about you getting through that storm. Well, we, we worried about you too, didn't we, Maria? What happened to your hand? He scalded it at the Venturellis. Oh, it is nothing. How is it with the little Francesca? Oh, she'll be all right. I'm going back to see her later on. What is the matter with these peasants? A child choking to death for lack of a simple tracheotomy, and they wouldn't let me touch her. Thank goodness you showed up when you did. Another minute, and I'd have had to knock out that crazy Bianchi to save his own child's life. And when I saw the car was broken down and you had to come back through that storm, I... What's the matter? Didn't Giuseppe bring you back? No. He never returned to the Bianchis after he took you home. I passed him a mile up the road. Why? What's wrong? The doctor hasn't been out. Not been out? You were with me, Father. What's the joke? What is this? I have been asleep here all the time. Ask Maria. But we all saw you. Mr. Angelo, their car. How come get that the doctor as you told me? I hope everything was all right. A man may well doubt what he sees with his own eyes. But when reliable witnesses give confirmation, it's difficult to disbelieve. The elder Dr. Maccabienti, however, didn't doubt this strange occurrence. He believed in the truth of the statement that he had made to his son. In the treatment of a patient, faith is often more important than medicine. It was enough for the good doctor that whatever the reason, one of his people had been saved. He didn't question, he accepted. Dr. Angelo did not as yet have this understanding. It puzzled and annoyed him to be unable to arrive at a scientific explanation. Well, he never did. But his acceptance by the peasants as the young doctore did bring him around to his father's way of thinking. The glamour of big city medicine gradually lost its power and he stayed with his father to help what soon became their people. Actual happenings as this one, on which tonight's story is based, occur much too frequently to be passed off lightly. Time and again in my research I've encountered reports of cases of this kind which have been thoroughly documented by reliable authorities. The explanation? There is none. At least, not one yet known to us. Please join me again for another journey into the world of the unexplainable that lies behind the veil. Good night.